I'd like to invite Dr. Uh, Bashara to come to the front. He is another Houston, Houston superstar, uh, trained at Baylor and uh, currently the program director at Loyola. He'll be talking about aneurysmal disease of the mesenterics. All right, good morning. So, um, you know, just a little bit of history. So the first uh, infected SMA uh, that was resected was a mycotic aneurysm, was done actually here by Dr. Uh, Cooley and DeBakey in Houston. Um, you know, just a, you know, a, little bit, a little bit of history at, the, uh, at uh, some of the stuff that these guys done. So, um, so these are the incidents of visceral artery aneurysms. Um, as you can tell, splenic is the majority of stuff that you'll be seeing in your practice. And even with that, it's not like we see a lot. I mean, these are the numbers, but they're still, in general, they're very rare. We don't see a lot of those. You might treat like maybe a couple a year. Uh, so, but again, the splenic, majority of those followed by hepatic, uh, SMA, and then the celiac, and some of these other branches uh, as you go along, and IMA is, is very, very rare. So, um, so the true, they could be true aneurysms, uh, and they could be false aneurysms. So obviously true is involves a, pretty much all the walls, as you know. Uh, so one third associated with other aneurysmal disease. And then uh, it could be degenerative like atherosclerotic, fibromyalgia, dysplasia, uh, 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 PNA, P PAN, and ehlers danlos syndrome. So the pseudo aneurysms are more like related to trauma, infection, iatrogenic injuries, and sometimes some like local inflammation, you have a patient with like hysteropancreatitis and sometimes they get um, some aneurysms uh, or sometimes some like portal hypertension and stuff, they could get some splenic aneurysms too. Um, so the natural history of the basic rupture, the mortality depending on the location could be anywhere between 50 to 100 percent and we'll talk a little bit about, about some of those cases, uh, which one has a higher risk. Uh, so 20 to 44 percent for the hepatic artery uh, aneurysms, 13 uh, percent for the celiac artery and it's much higher for the gastric artery and the gastric epiploic aneurysms, and that's why for those, really, there's really no guidelines for, the, uh, for them. We just, if you see them, you usually want to treat them because of the high risk of rupture. Um, some people believe that if the aneurysm is calcified, it's protective for rupture. Uh, I think the data is very weak uh, to, su to support it. Um, and that's how actually you're found, right? Someone gets an X-ray and they found like a calcified you know, mass or lesion in the left upper quadrant, and then sure enough, it turned out to be in a splenic uh, artery aneurysm. So um, uh, the splenic artery aneurysms, like I said, the, the majority, 60%. Um, there's a, a female to male, four to one, uh, usually age in the 50s. Um, they recommend that kind of treatment when it's more than two centimeters, and then the location and the treatment, it depends on its location too. So um, one of the explanations why uh, it happens more in females, we also, um, they, we believe it might be some hormonal uh, estrogen related, related. Um, and then uh, also some, some causes could be portal hypertension and also some underlying uh, autoimmune or collagen disease. So, uh, the, so you rarely have signs um, you know, until they rupture. Like I said, most of them they found incidental, you know, CAT scans or x-rays. Um, uh, and 20, 30 percent have double rupture. Do you guys know what that means, double rupture? So usually the first they rupture in the lesser sac, and then they usually freely rupture again. So that's why they get severe pain. Then it seems like they're okay. The pain doesn't really go away, and then then they rupture again freely in the in the uh, peritoneum. So uh, the mortality is 25% uh, uh, in general. So now here's why we basically drive repairing it in, in childbearing age women, because of the, if, if, they, if it ruptures and they're pregnant, the mortality for both the mom and the, and the, and the fetus is pretty high. And that's why we pretty much try to re recommending it, um, uh, treating it, especially if someone either is pregnant or planning to be pregnant. Um, you know, obviously, if it's rupture, it's an urgent repair. You have to do it. Um, and usually, for elective repair, it's more than 2 cm. I also added immunocompromised when I was asked to do the stock. Um, you know, I did do it yesterday. I added immunocompromised because I know the liver transplants. If you do a liver transplant and they have a splenic artery aneurysm, they usually also resect it because there's some data about rupture in those patients, too. Uh, we talked about pancreatitis and um, some of the risk factors. Some of the complications from treating splenic artery aneurysms could be pancreatitis. So uh, open repair depends on the location. So you can either exclude it, right? So if they have a robust uh, short gastrics, you can just basically uh, exclude it uh, and you, you remove the aneurysm. Um, uh, if it's in the distal, in the hilum, you can just remove it with a spleen. Uh, and then you can do it laparoscopic. We actually, one of the laparoscopic surgeons a couple of years ago, that's what he did. He went laparoscopically and actually removed it uh, and clipped it and then removed the spleen. Um, 
And then you can also stent it. You know, this is a straightforward picture, but honestly, a lot of the splenic, arter splenic arteries, they're actually very torturous. So it's not easy to basically put a, you know, to, uh, uh, track your stent all the way um, into those um, tortuous vessels. So, but it's doable, it's, 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 it's been done. And this is basically a picture of different ways you can do it. Like I said, you can just exclude it by ligating proximal and distal, you can resect it or, or just resect it uh, with the spleen. Now, for hematic, uh, hepatic RT aneurysm, like I said, it's the second most common aneurysm, 20% of splenic aneurysms, um, and most related to trauma, um, like young patients, and uh, you see quite a bit of those are intrahepatic because of the trauma. Uh, and then if it's non-trauma, usually in the older patient population, and some of the risk factors, um, you know, um, that are listed, and the, you guys can have the slides. Um, but what I'm going to point out to you is some of the distributions. So the majority of those are extrahepatic, uh, and then there's a few cases where it's either intra or just in the distal branches. And that actually that makes a difference how you're going to repair it, obviously. So again, they're usually found uh, incidentally. Um, the risk of rupture depends, uh, uh, for hepatic artery aneurysm, the risk of rupture is anywhere between 44 to 60 percent, and there's also a triad of Quenke, where you have abdominal pain, hematobilia, and obstructive jaundice. So again, uh, you know, again, repetitive, urgent repair for obviously for rupture and symptomatic. Uh, again, elective repair for if it's more than two centimeters or they have a PAN or fibromuscular dysplasia. And the, some of the complications, you know, from the dissection, you could cause arterial dissection or liver failure. And one thing when you do for, the, for these, you know, what, what advantage for open surgery when you're doing these hepatic artery aneurysms, you can actually do a test clamp. You can basically clamp and look at the liver to 15, 20 minutes, see if it's, you know, becoming ischemic and that will tell you whether you need to bypass it or not. Uh, but obviously, you, sometimes a lot of times we can know from the imaging, right, if it's GDA, if you have a robust GDA for the common hepatic artery, you can pretty much ligate and they should be okay, right, with the GDA. It's almost like similar, kind of similar ones. Sometimes we cover the celiac for to extend the landing zone and the TVAR, and they usually have a robust filling from the SMA. Um, uh, the proper hepatic artery, like also you can, usually you have to reconstruct it, um, or, um, and then you can have also use a cover stent. Now, as far as the right and left hepatic artery, again, depends how much each one is contributing to the liver, whether you can, you know, resect it either or, or not do anything or bypass it or do unblock resection. Uh, these are things that, you know, I guess you have to individualize per patient. Uh, now, the nice thing about the intrahepatic ones is usually you can get away by just coiling those um, either with coils or particulate. So um, you can't really do cover stents because it's so, so small, obviously. So, but coils will work. Uh, celiac RTA aneurysms, uh, less than the previous two, celiac and uh, uh, then, sorry, um, uh, uh, splenic and the um, hepatic, 5% of the cases. Um, and uh, so uh, I know you're going to get an afternoon talk about them, so I'm trying to like, go th quickly through some of the slides to go to the renal RTA aneurysms. So um, also they have a high risk of rupture on 20%, uh, and then usually they, have, they cause epigastric pain and, and uh, abdominal pain, a part of it because they actually st stretch the uh, splenic ganglions and, um, and the sympathetic chain, that's why you have uh, kind of this, this severe pain. Um, and also you could have the double rupture, where well, they rupture first in the lesser sac and then, um, and then in their peritoneum. So usually uh, for elective repairs, if it's more than 1.5 cm, we recommend the repair. Um, and then you can either treat them with ligation and do a bypass, uh, or if there's room, which is really hard when you have a celiac to pretty much put a stent in. It's hard first to, you know, usually need like a shorter, shorter stent, and then, but if they have like a pseudo aneurysm with a neck, you can probably try to call embolize it and get away with it sometimes. Uh, stent, you know, it's doable, but again, also like from the previous talk, you have to worry about the arcuate ligament pushing on it. Now, SMA is a, is a um, you know, could be a challenge because if they rupture, you know, not necessarily just you have to worry about risk of bleeding, also they could risk of bowel, which could be devastating, right, if they lose their bowel. Now, the majority of the SMA androgens are found in the proximal segment of the SMA in the first, like, 5, uh, five uh, cm. And then I typically, when I see SMA, um, I usually send a piece of the wall for culture because a lot of them could be infected. Um, <clears throat> so something to keep in mind. <clears throat> um, so, so a lot of them are usually uh, symptomatic uh, at diagnosis, and then the risk of mortality is 30 to 90%. Not necessarily just the, the risk of bleeding, like I said, because sometimes you, know, you have to resect some bowel. They already have like, some ischemic bowel, so and that could be also devastating. Um, now, if it's, um, again, depending on this location, I mean, stand graft, I mean, I have to look how much you're going to be covered, how much branches you're going to be covered, so it all depends on its own location. But the majority of those are usually uh, repaired with open 
And uh, like I said, I personally always stand the piece for, for uh, culture and I try to use a vein if I can. Um, Pancreas the adrenal and gastro the adrenals, um, again, they're very, very rare. Uh, but those, those pretty much you want to you know, repair them because of the risk of rupture. They're usually associated with alcoholism, so keep that in mind. Uh, or they could be, if they're true aneurysms, sometimes you see them, what we call like a postsynotic uh, dilatation from either stenosis or from repetitive trauma from the median uh, arcuate ligament. 70% uh, present with rupture and 20% mortality for the pancreatoduridinal aneurysms, uh, artery. So um, again, those are usually we recommend repairing them if you see them. One of the pictures is projecting well. Um, so um, for those usually, um, um, you know, usually open repair, uh, sometimes you have to uh, basically, uh, uh, it's, it's tough to do it with the, especially for the pancreatoduridinal, it's not an easy to get to it from an open repair. Luckily, we, you know, we can get to it from angio. So angiogram is very, very important for those cases or if you can reconstruct your CTA to really see how you're gonna get to it, whether you can get it from the celiac or from the SMA or sometimes from both ends to kind of treat it and then uh, embolize it. Uh, for the gastric and the gastroepiploic aneurysms, again, very rare. Um, majority of those are degenerative, but also could be related to alcoholism, again, um, especially in the elderly uh, males. 10% uh, gastric, and a lot of times uh, those, uh, they present with rupture on the presentation and have a very high mortality. <clears throat> and uh, basically, we recommend treating them. Uh, if any, any, once you find them, you usually recommend treating them because of the risk of uh, rupture and then mortality. And sometimes those, when you do open repair, you basically have to remove um, probably a piece of the stomach with it. Uh, so, um, and then, like I said, you can do embolization. Um, you know, I personally never seen uh, jejunal aneurysm. I've seen one IMA aneurysm, which is very rare. Uh, but again, these are very, very small, small series of, uh, of patients. But again, they could have, uh, they usually present with rupture at presentation too. So I'm running out of time. Let me just run quickly to renal artery aneurysms. Um, so usually they present 22% of visceral aneurysms. Um, you know, it could, they could be bilateral in like one third of the cases, and usually they're associated with like FMD or atherosclerosis um, uh, cases. And then uh, typically what they are associated with, either the patient present with like some pain or hypertension, uncontrolled hypertension, sometimes renal insufficiency. Um, so you could either uh, 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 treat them, usually also like a hematuria, that's another cause. Um, the less than 3% rupture, uh, but if they do, they have a 10% mortality. Uh, we don't really have a size criteria for those, um, but um, usually, come in, usually we use kind of two centimeters, but I personally have watched more than two centimeters in certain patients. Again, you have to individualize the patient, uh, basically. Um, but you can either treat it depending on its location, you know, if it's in the mid segment, you can, you know, it's an easy one to treat with a cover stent. If it's distal, that's going to be a problem. I think I have a, I should have a video of a case, I don't know if it's going to play. Is it playing? Yeah. So this actually a lady that I treated uh, two years ago. Uh, so she was having this like vague left flank pain. Honestly, I don't think it was related to the aneurysm. The aneurysm was barely two centimeters. But I don't know if you noticed that uh, the distal, this is the location of her uh, uh, renal artery aneurysm. And then also the challenge was in this case, she's born with one kidney. So talking about pressure in the case, <clears throat> and there was a distal kidney. So, um, uh, but uh, what we decided to do, actually I did this case with one of the transplants, actually was here at Methodist, one of the transplant surgeons, because we were worried if we have issues with the control uh, that we just basically take, we're gonna take the kidney out and reconstruct it and then uh, put it back. Uh, but we were able to basically resect it and do a vein patch, uh, and she did really well. Um, so, so the way you can treat them, either you can do a bypass um, uh, for these cases, or you can do, like we did in this case, aneurysmorphy with a vein patch. Um, or you know, if they rupture, they're unstable, then nephrectomy uh, sometimes is unfortunately the answer. Uh, or you can, like I said, take them out and then do uh, ex vivo repair and then re-implant them. Um, for endo, you know, again, depending on the location, but you know, if it's in the mid-segment, then your yeah, stenting would be ideal. Uh, and then if they're very distal, you can maybe get away with some glue uh, or cause, uh, which again, we did one not a long time ago, a few months ago, and a guy, after partial resec resection, he developed uh, pseudo-endorism that we were able to go in and coil it and put some onyx in it. Um, so I think I'm way out of time, so I think I'm gonna stop this as, uh, and then, any questions or I don't know if we have time at the end. All right.